I don't come from a horseshoe background. Uh, a horse background. No, my my father was an engineer. Um, I have uh, I have a brother, younger brother, um, twelve years younger than me, who is also a farrier, which I trained, and uh, uh, we survived. We survived the relationship, and I have a um, an elder sister. But uh, I didn't have any involvement with horses until I had my first riding lesson when I was twelve. My mother and father bought me a riding lesson to keep me out of trouble, and uh, had my first riding lesson when I was twelve. That got me hooked. I saw my first horse shod, my first pony shod at 14, and, and decided I wanted to be a farrier. Did you keep him home at the time, or, or were you in a, a, like a, a stable? It, it was at a stables, um, and s somehow my mother and father managed to find the money from somewhere to buy me a pony when I was 14, and it was the first time that pony was shod was when I decided that I wanted to be a farrier. So you know, what was your, 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 your schooling like over there? Oh, oh. <laughs> my schooling, I, I, I was not an academic in school at all, um, I didn't push myself um, and I suppose because I decided that I wanted to be a farrier and you didn't need any academic qualifications, I sort of dropped out of school. So um, I went to school but I didn't participate much really to be honest with you. It was a, it was, for me it was a waste of time, I just wanted to get out, I wanted to work with horses, I wanted to play, I wanted to done, a, done a, some sport as well. I used to, I used to um, do judo. Um, I used to do a lot of running. So not that you'd know now because of the stature, but uh, <laughs> um, so really school for me was not, was not a brilliant time. I didn't, have, didn't enjoy school at all. So you made the decision at about age 14 that you wanted to be a farrier? I made, I made the decision at, at, at 14. I loved it and, I, and I, I made the decision very quickly after. So I was about 15 when I, I definitely wanted to do that. And when I used to go to, I was so transfixed by it, when I used to go to the pony club, I bought myself a little bag and some tools in the vain hope that somebody would half pull a shoe off, that I could take this shoe off. You know, that's that, and I was sort of 15 at the time. <laughs> So that was that's how well, I was very very focused. I was very targeted towards this is what I want to do, and nobody could dissuade me of, of that decision. So how did you progress from from that in, into a into a career? Well, um, it was quite difficult to find an apprenticeship um, when I left school. Um, so I worked in a local riding school, um, and then I was lucky enough that I I did then at at the age of nineteen I found an apprenticeship. Um, and I started my apprenticeship then at 19. I'd done a four-year apprenticeship. I'd done an extended program because I, I actually worked for somebody uh, for 18 months um, and it, it didn't quite work out because it, it, it just wasn't challenging enough for me. So I decided during my apprenticeship to, to change um, the, the, my, my master as it was then. I decided to change because the, 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 my first master wasn't, it wasn't challenging enough for me. I just felt as though I wasn't, wasn't, being, wasn't being challenged. So. Well, the British system is, is that it is a, a locked-in four-year, two-month apprenticeship system. Um, and over the four years, what you do is you are then assigned to a, 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 a training farrier, an approved training farrier who historically is your master in olden terms. Um, Worshipful Company of Farriers run the examination process. Um, the Farriers Registration Council are responsible for the, the overseeing the training uh, and implementing, and between the two of them they, meet, they implement it. We've got um, three colleges that are presently uh, um, operating the, the uh, college-based training. So a candidate, once they're selected, will spend their four years, they'll do a two-month probationary period at the beginning uh, to make sure that both candidate and approved training farrier is suitable. Um, they will then go on from that then, they will, when they start their apprenticeship, they will do block release at, at college and it's all, in, it's all modulated. So we, we have a very strict um, modulated program. Uh, they will go to college then for blocks, so instead of one day release, they will go for weeks. So it's normally three weeks in the first block, four weeks in the first block, followed by the second block of the first year will be three weeks, and there are 27 weeks in total over the four-year period. So the group of fairies all across the country that are kind of rotated into these blocks? A now, absolutely, and, 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 and that, that, that is the training providers there are the three main uh, Farrier colleges. And at the at the end of that time, you are you are awarded 
a, a certificate? Well, no. You take the, you, the. There are two aspects to it. There is, there is um, a national qualification, which is which is achieved, which is modulated. Uh, the NVQ, um, national training uh, qualification, that is at the end of the third year, and at the end of the fourth year, you you actually sit and take your exam, which is essentially the Wishful Company Farrier's Diploma Examination. Um, that is in three parts. Um, it is a obviously a practical. Uh, examination where you will make a front and a hind shoe for a specific horse, um, fitted, nailed on, so they, that all of the mar all of the marking system is broken down into elements, as it, you would a shoe in competition, if you like. There is a written exam, which is a two-hour written exam, plus an oral exam as well. So the examiners have an opportunity to challenge you in 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 both parts. Uh. Does it happen that, that some people fail it at the very end, or is it? Yeah, yeah they do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's 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 it creates it's a benchmark. It, it, it it's um, it's a very very good system. It's a it's an exceptional examination process. It really is very very good. Um, but really, there shouldn't be any reason why anybody would fail. If you if you keep your standards up and you work to the framework within Ferrari training. There's no reason why anybody, with the exception of some somebody befalling an unfortunate incident, they get a little bit, a bit overzealous, they burn the shoe on a little bit too much. If the horse is lame at the end of it, then that's, an, that's a, a, unfortunately is a, a, a failure. Um, and if you take that element out, that could happen to anybody that's a bit nervous, you know, it represents the end of four years at the end of the, of the end of the day. So, you know, these people are very nervous when they take this exam. So they might overdress the foot a little bit or... So, with that exception, put that to one side, there isn't any reason why anybody should fail the exam. Is, is, there, is there the option of coming back and trying again? Yes, it is. Okay. Yes. And you can take whichever, whichever element you fail on, whether it be the theoretical or the, the, the practical, if you pass one element, then you can go back then and, and just take the, the element that you've that you've um, not passed on. And you can take whichever whichever element you fail on, whether it be the theoretical or the, the, the practical. If you pass one element, then you can go back then and, and just take the, the element that you've that you've um, not passed on. So so after you you, you, you passed your um, your exam with the the worshipful company of farriers, what, what how how did you progress then? Well um, I, I, despite the fact that, that I turned my back on school uh, and, and sort of left without, without any qualifications at all really, um, I had a thirst for knowledge and I, and I just, I was, I had soul searching questions when I first qualified because as you can appreciate when you're taught you have to have a methodology and a framework of which you're taught to. Um, which is the template when there's nothing wrong with that but but during the course and especially with anatomy and physiology I, I found that towards the end of my apprenticeship I had soul searching questions of some of the things that we were taught um, and and the anecdotal things that were laid down for conditions um, etc so when I when I started um, I practically then just decided to think outside the box a little bit and very quickly got a, a reputation for trying, uh, uh, which is what I've always said to people, you know, nobody ever gets fired for trying something, you know. Um, and there are a lot of lame horses out there and, and, and we, we, it, it was a wonderful opportunity for me because I, I basically had an, an opportunity to do whatever I wanted to with some of these horses to try to rehabilitate them to get them back. And then we very quickly found that patterns were emerging, that some of these horses were coming back after long lameness issues. So that, obviously I was locked into that then and that became my, my particular interest. Lameness was my particular interest. Here in, in this country we, we have kind of the perception of a of, of British farrier being, being the concave, toe clip, shod, shod with pretty tight heels. Yep. Is, is, is that changing? Uh, that's how I was taught. Okay. Uh, that's exactly the, 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 the process of which I went through. Um, and uh, I very quickly then started to adopt my own style. I had a, a particular style that, that I thought was appropriate. And it just happens to be that in you know, today's Ferrari, the world over, that seems to be the one that, that's, that's now more adopted. It's much more acceptable. Whereas 
1983, it wasn't quite so acceptable. Yeah, yeah I think things change. <laughs> and, and actually, there's a, there's a funny story because, because I was on a yard not long after I, I qualified. It was probably about six months after I qualified. And, uh, and the head girl, I was asked to, to, to shoe a jumper. And I shot a jumper in the style that I wanted to. I gave it a little bit more length and a little bit more width. And, um, and the owner then told me that he was talking to the head girl on this yard. And uh, uh, about what I'd done, and she said, she said, oh, she said, it, it just amazes me. She said because she said he he he, he always he never has any shoes that fit. They never fit, and 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 it's always stuck with me that you know <laughs> there was me trying to portray this sort of you know this concept, and and I was being judged on the fact that the shoes didn't fit. And actually, in their world, it didn't. It didn't. It wasn't penny on a penny. It wasn't tight. It wasn't toe clip it was it was shot with length it was shot with width it was shot with upright heels and it was something that she'd never never appreciated before <laughs> was, was, was that a bit of a, of a hard sell to, to to get people to accept this did, did that happen happen over time as, as, as you um, get more and more success with yes it, yeah it, it, it did I, I have to say that that my personality is such that that I will I, I carve my own my own road, my own route, if you like. If I firmly believe in something, then, then I, I'm quite happy to, to, to carry on down that path. And it was a path that, that, that historically was not that accepted within farriery. Um, uh, so I suppose, you know, a lot of my colleagues wondered what I was doing and, and, and thought I was a bit mad or something, I don't know. Did, um, did, did they voice their concerns to you that you had kind of like um, yes, they, the yeah, they did. Yeah, they did a little bit. You know, I have to say, not many of them fronted me. You know, personally, but the, I was acutely aware of what they were saying. What, what kind of horses it, were you shooting at the time? Um, anything and everything. It was. It was. I grew up um, in in the Welsh hills in in in, in Wales, obviously, uh, where uh, you know the Welsh cob, Welsh cob stallions. Um, uh, so you know, I cut my teeth on on some fairly raw, raw uh, shoeing, really. But, but there were some some high quality horses. That uh, no, were no, to not too. not in those days. No, 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 okay. not 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 at all. They were just mainly um, they were just mainly um, they were all amateurs, no professionals at all, and they were mainly uh, hackers. You know, happy hackers, uh, what we call them in the private owners in the in the UK. Happy, happy, happy hackers. I like that. Yeah, well, it is because they're happy. <laughs> That's what they like doing. So. <laughs> all right. So. Um, let, let, let's go on in your career then. So, how did how did you make the transition from the happy hackers to the to the professionals with with the with the high level horses? Um, to be truthful, I don't know because because uh, I don't know. I think it, it evolved over time. Um, I, I very when we started to see some of the effects of what we were doing, and um, then I had one or two referrals from vets who then would ask me to have a look and, and, and it sort of progressed from there really. Um, I never consciously went out to, to, to think that I'm going to uh, uh, carve a path uh, or a career towards shoeing profession for, for professional people. It, it, it just sort of it, it transpired and over a period of time really. Did you still live in the same place where you started out or did, did you relocate? Um, I, I, re I relocated, but only only about twelve miles. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I mean, that's a in the UK, that's a long way. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> so relocated about twelve miles. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about your current business. I mean, do you do you, you, you have apprentices now, and, and, and how big a business? Do yeah. You have I I currently have two apprentices, um, both of which are, are mature apprentices. So so they're they're not young. In the UK, there tends to be a lot of very young people that go into the industry, and and we're 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 getting more towards it is like it's in America, now, where you get older people. Somebody perhaps is retraining. You know, they've decided that that, that their profession is not for them, so they decided to come into it. And I've got two mature students at the moment um, uh, who are, I have to say they're probably the best ones, that, you know, some of the best ones I've had. Um, they're very, um, very forward thinking, very dynamic. And, and uh, I find I get energy from them. You know, you can actually get energy from being with people. Oh, yes. uh, with, and and uh, it, to me, it's a great, great buzz to have them around because they're just, they just, uh, you know, they, 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 they want to achieve things, they want to do things. Their standards are very, very high. They, they, so they, are they currently going through the process? Or? They are, okay. yes. They're, 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 one is in the first year and the one is just started your second yeah. year. 
it, so, how does that work? That they, 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 some people that who are that apprentice with you, they'll go on to stay stay with you then, or there's some with with some masters, or you, if, if they have the opportunity. Yeah, they will. Yes, yeah, they will. Um, uh, quite a few of my apprentices stay on for a period after whilst they develop their business. What I've tended to do with the majority of them is when they finished, I've given them a proportion of 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 of, of business. So in of general work, right. um, because the, some of uh, as they mature into their apprenticeship and they get towards the, the end, they've been looking after uh, just a few people on their own. Right. So I tend to then give them those then as a as a sort of startup block, if you like. Um, but uh, I think in the UK we're going to see things change now because there's quite a few barriers now um, in the in the United Kingdom, and I think we're going to see partnerships emerging more because I don't think the work is out there now for, for, you know, for people starting up on their own as much as it was in, in our day. I, I, I understand that, that, that the, the process of education is, has changed a little bit since, since you went through the process. Is, is, is that true or, or, or how, are yeah, things, how are things changed it, now it's, since um, Well, I can tell you, um, uh, hot off the, the press, if you like, things have changed quite dramatically. Um, we have a system because it's government funded we have a system where a government agency come in um, uh, called Ofsted and do a report as a result of the of the report they they were not in favor of current of continuing with funding um, currently under the regime that we had so the regime has now been changed we had a management agency which is now gone we're in the process now of handing over the 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 um, uh, the working uh, daily duties of the management agency to the colleges so they will undertake some of the duties that the management management agency took on and there is a draft of, 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 of key areas that had to be the one that, that Ofsted report identified that needed looking at for further education within training and we're currently going through those now and implementing those um, the biggest one is going to be the, that that uh, training providers ie uh, masters like myself will have to hold a nationally recognized coaching and training certificate so it proves that whilst we might be very very good farriers and perhaps less uh, not quite as good at, at, at tutoring um, it gives them uh, as an ability then to all go through that process so every single approved training farrier that wishes to, 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 to continue to train now has to go through that process so you think that, that, those, that that's a good idea? Uh, I think it's a fantastic idea. Um, I, I, <laughs> I have to say that I'd done it 12 years ago um, because I recognized that, that this particular module was right for training. So myself plus six or seven other guys got together uh -huh. and we all took it. And it's probably the one single biggest influence and, and, and advancement in my ability to be able to train young people is taking that. So I was a huge um, advocate for adopting that policy and, uh, and, and I've been instrumental in, in with the Worshipful Company and um, with, uh, with the Registration Council in looking at that to see whether there's a current module that we can use. And that's being set up now by the colleges. They're just so. Is that going to be set up so like like in year one, these these, these guys should be should be able to to to, to do this in this process to a, to a high degree of, 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 of well. This quality. is for the this is for the training providers. This is for ATFs from, like myself. And what what we'll do is we we will we will have to attend college ourselves, right? And we will go through the process then of um, the 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 best practice techniques for training and coaching. Um, and that is a that is going to be a nationally recognised certification. So it it falls into further education within the United Kingdom and coaching and training. That that's one of the holes in our system, I think, here in this country is is, is the training of, of our young farriers. Mm. And I, I think that maybe that that's something that we could we could really benefit from. Well, I think I think you know what what we all have to remember is is that when you when when you're as, when somebody is assigned to you and you work, it's like a marriage, isn't it? You know, an apprenticeship with, with, with an individual is just like a marriage. Number one, you've got to find the right person that you get on with yeah. and, and you bond with. And number two, you are going to be the biggest influence on their, on their, their career and, and in some cases their life as well. So, so I think it's, it, it, there is a massive amount of responsibility that goes with training, not just teaching them how to shoe horses, 
but how to engage with 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 customers you know how to how to how to get out of tricky situations you know and and the classic one for me is I keep saying to them it's important as it is just as important to know when not to say something as when to say something so it's all of those things isn't yeah. it that yes. you know that we've been around long enough that we've made the mistakes what we try and do is shorten that path for them somehow that's a very valuable experience I tell you so um, did, did, were you ever in, in, involved in, in the contesting and, and all of that sort of thing that the, the, the Brits are, are so good um, y yes I was uh, but I was a, a reluctant um, a reluctant competitor I suppose really is the best thing I, I I was fortunate enough that I served my apprenticeship with you know the great Billy Crothers so Billy and I served our apprenticeship together at the same time he was How 12 fortunate. yeah well it's, unf it's also unfortunate because if, if you know if you try, if you try and, and manufacture anything after Billy's manufactured it you're never gonna, you're never going to get anywhere but closely it, remotely close to it so but if you get anywhere close that's better you're, you're ahead of absolutely else. absolutely so um so i was a sort of reluctant competitor really uh, i i did do it in my early days but um and uh, and had some degree of success as well but it, but it never it 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 never really was my thing you know showing competitions was never really for me i prefer the the the, the real life because you know how we shoe horses in a shoeing competition is not necessarily how we shoe horses in real life and, right. and it's the real life tricky situations that I that I prefer that's the challenge for me so what is your current business like what, what is your rig like and and, and and what is it how do you structure your your, your, your week well we have a um, we, we have a, um, a, a dual system we have a, a static um, forge and facility quite a quite a large forge where all the referrals come into so so that anything that's referred to us will, will come in. So we'll have an in-house um, where we have coke fires, gas fires, and everything else uh, that you can think of. And then the mobile rig, um, of course in, in the United Kingdom it's not like here where we don't have trailers, then it tends to be actually encompassed in the vehicle. So I have a mobile rig uh, that we go, but we can do anything out of that. So it's the same as here really, you know, all the, 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 the welders, the drillers, right. and, and everything is there. So we can, we can simulate whatever we want but I, I, I have to say my preference when I first have referrals is to do them in my static workshop because it's an environment that is conducive for doing and turning out whatever you want to. So what, what percentage of your business do you get to do at home then in the board? Um, I would say that, that, that it's probably uh, somewhere around about 25% is in the forge um, but because I do a lot of professional yards now um, I do an awful lot of traveling, so um, when I go, I, I'm sort of there for the day, really, uh, at, a, at a yard, um, uh, and that means that means that they're obviously a greater distance away from my from my facility. And you know, when you, when you're looking after a yard or a number of horses within within a yard, I try not to have not to be away any more than sort of two days if I can, really. Um, and, we're, and again, we're, we're lucky enough. Although, although I say I travel a lot, you know, the furthest I travel would be would be three three and a half hours. Um, so in the UK, that's quite a distance. But I mean, but I I don't do the numbers anymore. Um, so I I won't travel, I won't travel great distance and then do the numbers. Um, at one time, you did do the numbers, so. At one time, I did. That's how we built the business up. Right. You know, the business was built up. We had, we had at one time, we had three vehicles, four vehicles on the road. You know, there were seven of us running around, and and we were just, just pushing out the numbers. You know, one of the one of the things that that that, that, that people are often ask you is is you know which is your favourite horse, which is your favourite horse, and they always expect you to say, well, you know, it's it's got to be Vallegro, you know, because of where is you know where he is. But actually, there's a there's a little cob, a little hairy cob that is on the top of the of a, of a uh, or by the side of a coal tip up in the up in the hills, that's 16 years of age that died almost died two years ago with laminitis, and we managed to resurrect this from somewhere, and he's been in the family all his life. He's a member of that family, and his name is Charlie, and he's my favourite. And he doesn't do anything. He just goes out for a, a, a hack, 
but he's he's the most amazing pony and he, he came back from the brink of death um, so that's the sort of mixture that we've got and I think that's important because I I, I, I actually don't I don't see myself as a as, as a, a sort of just working for the elitist people it gives us a major opportunity the stuff that we do for a horse that we would you know, expect to go to a major championship show and win a medal is you know, we tend to throw everything at it, you know, in an attempt to look after these horses, to prevent injury, you know, and to enhance performance. So research development in any any form is what we look at to see how we can do it. But that's what I call the pyramid system. We throw everything at, at the, this elite. But actually, it's the, it's the people underneath that benefit from it. So. The lady that wants to go to the to the riding club and, and wants to compete at the riding club has disposable income of, of a fraction compared to Carl Hester who wants to go to, to, to the Olympics. But actually, in their life, it's exactly the same. So the effort and the, and, and the challenges that are placed on the lady that wants to go to the, to the riding club and compete at the riding club, to her is it's equally as important as it is to Carl, who wants to win a medal. And I think, you know, as a service provider, which is what we are, you know, we're duty bound to give them that service at whatever level that they want. And I really like the fact that we've got customers that I've been dealing with for 30 years, and, and they're still, we're still shoeing their ponies and shoeing their horses as well. That, for me, is a nice balance. So currently, what like what what is your per percentage of horses do like like um, you're you're still doing the, the the lower level horses? I presume you're doing probably some. Uh, there are no no hunters in in, in there is there now. Oh, there is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a, there's still there's still hunting. It's all drag hunting now. Um, um, field hunters, not not show hunters. Uh, yeah, so. okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's all drag hunting. Um, so, but I don't do any hunters anymore. I made a conscious decision. Um, I had to. As the, the performance side of things was increasing, I was finding it extremely difficult to, to, to keep everything uh, and, to, and to, to provide a good service to, to all of the different sectors. Mm -hmm. So, and over the years with the apprentices going, I've given them a certain amount of work, each one. So, so the, the sort of, the, 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 the grassroots end, if you like, uh, and the general work um, has, has dropped off and the performance has, has increased. So at the moment we do, I mean, I would say 80% of our, 80 to 85% of our work is performance horses. But I've still got those, those few that, that, that we do. You when, know, when you performance horses, what, what, what um, well, performance in, in dressage uh, and, and predominantly dressage, jumping and eventing. Those are the three, the three elements. So of, of, of those three, what, what percentage of, of, of those do you do? Oh, um, eventers, eventers would be uh, uh, out of the, on a percentage wise, eventers would be probably the lowest. That would represent about 10%. Uh, jumpers would be uh, 20%, 70, 70% would be, would be dressage horses. That's my particular thing. Well, take a, a horse that, that doesn't have any, any pathology. He's, he's, he's in the prime of life. He has, he has pretty decent confirmation. What, what kind of shoes? Do you do you use on him, and how do you set him up, and and, and what, what are your guidelines for, for trimming and fitting and, and, and that sort of thing? I think the first thing that you've got to do is is you have to appreciate um, uh, what the horse has to attain. We look at we look at an awful lot of, of, of uh, anatomy and physiology, the static version, so we understand anatomy and physiology. So we shoe accordingly. We shoe accordingly to the weight distribution between the front and the back. But what you have to appreciate first and foremost, with, especially with, with dressage horses, is the fact that you are going to change the dynamics of this horse by virtue of its training and the way it's ridden and its performance. So I shoe, there's a lot of debate out there, and, and we've heard it uh, uh, again it's been it's been uh, mentioned over the last couple of days about length of shoes and length behind uh, opposed to in front um, i set my dressage horses up that i i will always always give them support and create a platform of support to a hind limb probably more than the majority of people would do because i'm conscious of the fact that what a dressage rider wants to do is to take that ratio from the front and to sit it onto the back. And the minute that you do that, 
you have completely changed the profile and the dynamics of the hind limb. I think the hind limb is misunderstood. I think we don't, as, as an industry, we don't know enough about it. We don't appreciate it enough. Um, and there's not enough research and development that's gone into the hind limb for us to, to have more credibility and an understanding of how we shoe them. But that, that's a path that I've, that I've, I've created. Uh, I've always been a believer that, that when you shoe, you're not shoeing the hoof capsule, you're actually shoeing the ascending limb individually. Um, so one limb that actually might have a slight rotation, you might want to shoe in a different plane to one that doesn't have the ro rotation, natural rotation or conformational. Because although you say that, 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 um, that it's set up perfectly, there is no such thing as a perfect horse. So it's the degree of acceptability of, of, of the deviation. What, what kind of shoes are you, are you currently using? Um, well, we've gone we've gone over to um, uh, training wise in, in in the United Kingdom now. Virtually everybody trains on an, on a synthetic surface. So we've we've seen an explosion in set in synthetic surfaces over the last twenty years. Interestingly, what I've been trying to advocate, certainly for for all of that time, is that if we can have a change of underfoot conditions, then why are we still placing in a lot of cases concave shoeing iron? on horses that are now working on a synthetic surface. My own preference is um, a flatter, wider, three-quarter um, fullered section um, because I think that is the best platform that you can create, whether, you, whether you're talking about protecting inside the hoof capsule, so you're looking at, at, at pathology inside, or whether you, 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 you're, you're extending it outside of the, of the, in some cases, outside of the hoof capsule, to then allow the dynamics of the ascending limb to work onto. Um, I prefer much flatter, just keeps them on top of the surface. It, it stops the, 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 uh, the foot from grabbing. Um, so there's quite a lot of trade-off uh, as a result of that. I would say that we fit, gosh, uh, with the exception of, of, of the eventers and, 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 the happy, and the happy hackers and the general horses, everything else is in, is in three-quarter fullard. I'm not, I'm not uh, a one-shoe-fits-all syndrome. I don't believe in that. I will use anything. So I, I, I tend to use a number of, of different various types. Um, the majority of my performance horses would be in Kirkhouse. We're, we're seeing, and, and a lot of people are talking about uh, these synthetic surfaces have really changed what we put on the bottom of the horse's foot yeah. because of the fact that they, it's such a hard base and, and such a such a thin covering on top. And, and a lot of these horses, especially at the at the end of a of a prolonged show, uh, especially a multi week show, start start coming up with with, with problems. And, and and so where we used to be concerned with with giving them traction, now it seems to be we want to start giving them less traction. So, it, so so we get a little bit of the. You, and you're finding that the same thing. Without without exception, that that is the case, and 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 certainly on the world stage, um, the final catalyst to that was was um, when we in Athens when we saw the unprecedented number of jumpers that were injured as a result of the surface, where where the surface wasn't conducive to jumping. It was it was they put um, rock ash uh, underneath, then they put a, a layer of turf. And, and as beautifully groomed as it was, these horses were landing, and as they were landing and twisting, they were literally tearing parts of the turf away. Um, and we, we did see an unprecedented number of horses that suffered injuries as a result of that. And, and the FEI quite rightly then um, set up a program looking, a research project looking at, at surfaces. And that was the last international championship that I think we'd ever see you know, at that level, at the Olympic level, on a, on a, 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 on a grass surface. Um, I think our understanding that there's a lot of research that's gone on, to, uh, gone on with, with surfaces. We have a much greater understanding now of the right surface, the better surface and the different surface and how you can alter it between dressage and jumping. Um, uh, and there's a lot of technology that's gone into that. But you see, then I bounce it back then, that we've got all this technology and this understanding in research and development on the surfaces, on testing the surfaces, on creating the right surface so that we can get the best, the best performance, looking after the horses as well, is, uh, being, being at the primary sort of uh, concern there as well. And yet from a shoeing point of view, we're still doing the same thing.
and 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 you you know that I think there's an anomaly there, there's an imbalance there somewhat that we're still seeing. You know, is it right? Is it right that we still that we're still using concave shoes? You know, in some cases, uh, I don't know. Um, I don't either. Don't look at and, me. And and, <laughs> and and I think that we can. And this is the trouble. I think we can. And when you come along to 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 symposiums and and and, and summits like, like like this is this is what we get. We get. We get mixed messages sometimes, depending on who it is. So we we do need more research and development, uh, and a greater understanding uh, on on what is what is a, a, you know a better shoe for a better surface. Is, is there much of a change in, in in what you use for shoes from a horse that, that that's just entering training, and then as he goes up up through through the levels, to by the by the time he gets to, to Grand Prix, it it it's less a change of shoeing. Uh, of the actual of, of, of the material that we use, there might be a, a change in the style and the fit in the style and, and and the only way I can explain that hopefully better is to say that 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 I shoe the decision for me to shoe horses I, I quite like horses barefoot for as long as possible, but the decision to shoe a young dressage horse may be because it 's gone up in its training therefore it is starting to increase the load on and predominantly on the hind legs and then when you watch these horses dynamically and you see the lever arms and you see the the, the effects of that extra load that is the time that I'll make a decision that this horse now needs to be shod it's not because of wear it's not because of abrasion it's not because of anything else it's purely because you are noticing the development of body mass, you notice in the development of muscle mass, but also you notice in the fact that these horses are changing their gait, trying to take this load. At what level typically is that? Oh, that could be that could be as young as as um, as four year olds, five year olds, you know, depending on their on the because a lot of these horses now uh, are their movement is huge, and people get carried away with the movement. So young horses now are moving much bigger, much bolder, freer. Um, and as a consequence of that, there may be occasions when from the, the Ferrari sector, can you look at it and think, we just need to protect this a little bit because this horse is, is so big and bold and has such a big, a big gait that it just needs protecting, just needs looking after. Who, who makes these decisions to make the shoeing changes in, 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 your, in your business? Um, well, we, we make them collectively. Um, uh, I spend um, a, a lot of time looking at horses, um, and, and we 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 watch horses being trained as well. Uh, you know, the competition is the final final piece of the jigsaw, isn't it? But the repetitive training uh, for for all of these horses is something that that we take into account. Um, so I will watch these horses being trained as well, uh, and then I'll discuss it with the vet, uh, with the trainer. Uh, and, and obviously the rider and the connections as well because, because it's really important uh, to get buy-in. If you're going to execute a form of change or if you feel as though you need to intervene with a form of change then, then everybody must fully understand the reasons why you've decided that a change is necessary. That correlates very often with, with clinical assessment whether it be veterinary um, or or uh, physiotherapy, so we will cross-reference that. The vet will say, well, we're, we're seeing edema here. The, the, the physiotherapist will always be struggling in a particular area. So we have a sort of round table discussion and say, okay, what's the best that we can get out of this? Um, uh, and that includes all the parties, because you have to have buy-in. And, and if one part decide that, that they don't want the change, then we don't execute it. Maybe we could talk a little bit about your most famous client. The, 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 the Carl Hessler yard and, 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 and their, their most famous equine star of Bellegro. How, how, did, how, did, how long have you been working for Carl? Oh gosh, about 10 years now. Yeah, about 10 years. And um, so I, I tend to see these, the wonderful thing for me is I tend to see these horses coming in at a very early stage. And, and uh, Bellegro was n no exception. You know, I, I saw him when, he, when Carl bought him. Uh, and, and brought him over. What age was he? And um, I can't remember now. Actually, it must have been about about six years ago. I think now. Okay, so he, um, he was he was he, green. he was oh he was very green. Yes, and and you know, Carl runs the most amazing yard. I mean, it is. Tell, uh, tell us about that. Oh, he he he. he 
The only way I can describe it is, is I think some people's perception of dressage and, and, and certain sort of European, certainly European dressage, has been that it's been, dare I say, slightly dictatorial. So these horses have been made to do this. Carl will ask and he'll ask again and 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 then his training methodology is is extraordinary um, uh, he he doesn't tell these horses what to do he will ask and he will encourage um, I think uh, I, I he, he, there's without question he is a very sensitive rider he's a very careful rider he's a very very clever rider um, and sometimes that can go against you be, be, because from a, uh, strictly from a, um, a, a ferry or, or veterinary or physiotherapy point of view, we might well notice something. But he has an unbelievable, as most professional riders do, have an unbelievable ability to be able to mask it. So uh, hence the reason why we always look at the horses free. So we'll always trot them up, walk them up and trot them up. Might put them on the lunge as well, but we'll also see them ridden as well to make sure that, that you know that he's not being clever in his in his methodology of how he rides them. Um, the, uh, the, all the horses are peaceful. Um, it, it, whenever anybody goes there, they're always amazed that, that it is a very tranquil place. There's chickens running around and there are dogs running around. And the setup of the yard, I think, from a psychological aspect for horses is brilliant because it is in a U shape and all the horses, it's all outdoors and all the horses look over at one another. Um, and uh, they all they all seem all the horses seem really really happy i know it sounds a bit bizarre but but you go to other yards where sometimes you know it's there's a bit of tension there or or the horses all go out in the field because he's a firm believer that horses should be should be treated normally so um when we get into the debate um as very often we can do of how much length can you put on shoes you know and then they say oh well that's all very well but you know Allegra goes out in the field. You know. Not with another horse, though. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, no, they go out in the field with other horses as well. They'll go out together. They don't... No. no they go out together. They'll go out... They, yes, they're, they're, they're buddied up, so there'll be two or three of them in, 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 a, in paddocks together. Um, uh, Utopia, obviously, you know, being a stallion, he'll go out on his own. Um, so when I get into the debate of people saying, well, you know, that's all very well, you know, you've showed us this, but you can't give because my horses go out in the field. And I say, well, you know, try telling Carl Hess that because his does as well. And we lose the odd shoe. You know, sometimes when these horses haven't been out for a while and or they've been off to, to competitions yeah. and then he wants to give them a little bit of free time, yeah. you know, they go ballistic. And, and, and we all know that's when you're likely to pull the shoes off. Um, they all go out hacking, every single one of them. There's not one horse that doesn't go out hacking as well, so they'll go out hacking down the road. And Carl has a, has a, a wonderful friend, um, and it was an old trainer a lady, who is, I, I hope I don't get this wrong, but she would be in her, she'd be in her late 70s now. And, um, and she rides Vallegro out. When she's there, she will ride Vallegro out down the road with the others. Is that easy? Oh, he's, he's the most extraordinary horse. He... he, he He's just amazing. And, it, and in fact, I was there one day, because uh, I just get him out after we have walked him up and trotted him up and seen him. Um, and I know him now anyway, so we just get him out and tie him up. And he's the same as any other horse. He's not treated any differently to any of them. And, um, and whenever you get visitors there, you know, they always come in and they always want to see, you know, who's the star. And I, I happen to get out from underneath this horse and I've got sort of, you know, they're saying hello to them and chatting to them and I've got my arm. And they're saying, well, oh, well, where is he? Where is he? And I said, well, which one? Well, the star. And I said, well, you're looking at him. And he's just... What advice would you give to young farriers coming up in, who, who want to get, get into a shoeing dressage horses? I think, first and foremost, I mentioned before, you have to understand the concept of it. Um, when, we, when, we, when we talk in general terms of, uh, of shoeing, you have to understand the anatomy and physiology and then you have to be able to put it into a functional state. So this understanding of what this dressage horse is expected to do is fundamental in your ability to be able to shoe them. Um, I think you have, to, you have to be interested in movement. The reason I got into dressage was because it was a practical and intellectual challenge to see how we could change, if we could change things. Um, so that's that's really what, why I got involved with it. 
because to me, as a practitioner, I wanted to know the things that we were doing, whether we could influence certain aspects. And we now, of course, you know, know that we can. Um, so I think you, 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 have to, you have to have that thirst for knowledge. Uh, and you have to be patient because, you know, it, it takes nine years, ten years to create a Grand Prix dressage horse. And that's an awful lot of long time and an awful lot of things that can go wrong in that time that you are responsible for. So I think, you, you know, you have, to be, you have to be adaptable but you also have to, you have to take control of, 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 of that situation. Part of the discussion at, at this summit has, has been about, uh, about horses that uh, um, have mismatched feet, the high-low syndrome that we call it. Do you see much of that in, in, in Great Britain? We do see a lot of it. Um, I'm going to stick my neck out and I'm going to say that, that, that as an industry, we do not understand the pathology enough for us to have a judgment at this moment in time on how best to deal with them. I think we deal with them as well as we can and I think different people will have different approaches towards that and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, interestingly enough, I, I, um, uh, one of my pet things is to set up a study, which I've already done one. Um, looking at um, the different movements of the lever arms in mismatched feet. Find out where that comes from. Um, we, we, um, it's an observation, not a criticism. But what we tend to do, as far as what we tend to do, is we tend to throw things on the table, like, you know, well, you know, we can measure the length of stride and we can, we can. When you start to do research, proper research, you find that that there are certain things that are very, very difficult to quantify. Um, and I think the industry makes, myself included, uh, in the past, I've made wide sweeping statements with very little evidence base to back it up. Um, so I think we, as an industry, we're doing as, as well as we can. But I think we're at the embryo stage of understanding a lot more about it. Um, I certainly, over the next three years, hopefully we'll get a greater understanding of it. We intend to, 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 to do a trial on it, then um, on various horses that all have the same mismatched feet. Uh, so hopefully we'll come up with something at the end of it. What is your current approach? Um, well, it differs from most people. That's the problem. <laughs> oh, that, that's good. <laughs> well, I, I mean, it, 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 it does differ from, from most people. My, my I had a light bulb moment um, when, when, um, uh, when we saw a wonderful uh, bit of video earlier on uh, yesterday of showing what happens to the angle of, of the shoulder when the lever arm comes up. And that was a light bulb moment for me because I've been trying to, to and, and I told him so, I've been trying to get, uh, uh, to, to get people to understand that a change of, uh, of angle of shoulder will affect the distance from the point of shoulder to the to the to the ground, and uh, and that was a, a serious light bulb moment for me. I just thought this is brilliant to be able to show that. Um, I'm not in favour of. I'm quizzed as to why the heel is there, and I think I understand why the heel is there. And I think so far the work that we've done on the force plate is sort of alluding to why the heel is there, and it's because it's all to do with pressure of pressure of the foot. Because this is, this is a, 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 on a, the upright foot, high heel okay. so the high heel um, has to be there for a reason, because it doesn't just decide to grow. Um, and if you look at the if you look at the lever arms and you look at, at, at where they are in relation to to the body mass, you'll find that one lever arm is closer under the vertical than another one. As a consequence of the of the close closer under the vertical, a more upright and closer to the centre of mass it then dissipates more static pressure through the front anterior phase of the foot and therefore you'll have a more upright dorsal wall and you'll have a heel which will compensate for it. I conversely to a lot of what's taught have always worked on the opposite point of view and said if the heel is there why are we chopping it off? And I understand the concept of if you chop it off, you'll get the, the you'll get more pressure, and therefore you will you will get the foot to open up. 
but it's there for a reason. Um, and so far the work, that, the, the small amount of work that we've done on force plate is, is alluding to that. So I'm not in favour of chopping the heel off. I'm not in favour of, of um, excessively. I think the, the danger that you've got there is that if it is a true limb length differential and you increase pressure around the margins of the deep digital flexor by dropping the heel too much and not balancing the foot, you then have a danger that, that you are likely to create a mechanical foundering or mechanical rotation of the pedal bone as a result of the extra tension that you're putting on, on the deep digital flexor. So, so, so that's, that's it, it's very difficult to explain, isn't it? You, you've almost got to have material or you've got to have the horse there to, to be able to fully appreciate it. But no, I, d I, don't, I don't tend to agree with the trend of taking the heel off. What do you do with the, with the low foot? Ah, well the low foot, um, the low foot conversely, the one that the, the, the lever arm that's taking more pressure because it is a longer lever arm, so therefore more static pressure, remembering that horses spend 24 hours a day doing what they want and probably one hour a day doing what somebody else tells them to do, it, it's the static pressures that actually develop feet because the foot will bend and flex in any given direction subject to the pressure that's placed on it. So if we take the upright one and say, well, there's not much pressure through the heel, therefore we have a heel. If we take the longer lever arm, the longer lever arm then is slightly further forward and it does have more pressure coming through the, the caudal back part of the foot. So what we have there is you have a compressed heel or heels, but more importantly, the digital cushion becomes deflated over a period of time. So what I do with those is I, I place a dental impression material in there as an external digital cushion to balloon it and to, and to hold it up. By doing that, you then allow the foot or the, low, the, 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 the hoof wall not to compress in the caudal aspect under the weight bearing phase uh, and the heel will start to grow and start to grow rather rapidly. I tend to shoe then a shoe that is and shoe to the center of, of, of rotation of the coffin joint uh, as a lot of people would. So you take the pressure off um, reduce the toe length as much as possible, but tend to do it in the plane of the foot rather than rather than dorsal wall dressing. Right. But, and, but and, and so in that instance, would you, would you use a would you use a toe clip shoe on that? No, one? definitely not. Right. No, no, a square toe. I tend to use square toe bar shoe with dental impression material to as a as a digital cushion, an external digital cushion to just inflate it back up again. I, I have found that that. Just sitting and looking at a picture that that when the, when the camera is is at at, at foot level is is so revealing, you know that, that you see things that you that you never never ever picked up looking looking down at it from 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 two two feet away or whatever. And, and, and the gr a great thing with those is that, is that if you if you take if you if you're at the vet veterinary practice and you take X-rays before and after, you would not believe how uh, again, you know. Um, uh, one of the questions I've got, or I very often ask, is can you influence the, 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 the margins and the rotational value of the coffin joint? And the majority of people say, well, no, you can't because it's fixed. And, and actually, I don't believe that. And, and certainly the work that we've done, you know, in that particular case, you can, you can inflate it. And rather than put a wedge heel on, you can actually rotate the joint um, anteriorly and pick it up um, just by inflating and not by wedging. So, so it's your opinion that, that you can get a digital cushion to regenerate it? Oh, absolutely, without question, yes. There are, there are uh, acceptable tolerances uh, and, and that, that you have, to, that, that you have to, to take on each individual case because it depends on the anatomy and physiology that's created the problem in the first instance and also how the, 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 the hoof capture was altered over a period of time. So, so it's what I call phase one, phase two. The prognosis may differ from each case depending on how much you can get, depends on, 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 on what you're dealing with in the first instance. And that's one thing we don't do. We don't categorize these. We tend to, when you sit in, in, um, in, in, in round table meetings and stuff like that, and, and you'll hear one person will say, well, what it worked for me. And then somebody else will say, well, I tried it and it didn't work for me. But, but, but actually you could be talking about fundamentals which, were, which are completely opposing. Yeah. Um, and until we categorize it, and say, right, this is grade one, this is grade two, this is grade three. The reason it didn't work for, for you was because you were dealing with grade three. The reason it worked for you was because you were dealing with grade one. Yes. And it would work. 
Um, but I think we tend to put things in boxes and want to tick them and, and say a long toe and a, and a deflated underrun heel is a long toe and it isn't, not always. I, I think that's a, um, a, a real deficiency of, of, of our profession is the fact to, to, to quantify and, 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 and get more specific exactly what we're, what we're talking yep. about. And, and I, I think we need to develop a system that, that we're talking about, we're probably talking about a grade, grade one or a yep. grade four in, yep. in, in severity. Now, what, what kind of horses are, are you seeing now that are, 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 are a lot of your horses, especially for the upper levels coming from Europe, are they're, they're warm blitz? Um, well, we, well, the United Kingdom have, have had an amazing um, breeding program now, you know, by, by a, a number of people. So we're seeing a lot of homebreds, uh, and of course there is the, the European influence as well. But there's, an, there's a lot of horses being bred in the UK now, very good horses being bred in the UK. In, in the foundation stock, are, yes. are European warm blood. Yep, okay. yep, yep. And, and there's they're a little bit more. Well, the United States is, is getting a, a little yeah. bit of a, of a, now a history yeah. of producing mm. homebreds. Well, dressage globally is, has just exploded, hasn't it? You know, I was only hearing the other day that 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 um, there was a trainer from from the United Kingdom, quite a well-known trainer from the United Kingdom, is, is going out to South Africa every month. Uh, and and we'd never have thought of that, would we? You know, a number of years ago, you'd never think, well, what dressage in South Africa? No, yeah, it's 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 global. It's the fastest uh, um, increasing number of people taking up equine sport um, is dressage. Yeah, I, I, I can believe yeah, that. it's the biggest growth. I, I see it in, in Wellington, you know, specifically where the, you know, where the best in this country congregate yeah. for the winter, and, and and it was just a matter of a decade ago that the horses were okay, but but I, I went to a show the other day and there were some very very nice yeah. horses, and a lot of them. Yeah, yeah. There used to be a time you used to go to an international competition. There might be one or two you take home. And now you you'd like you you'd need a fleet of lorries, wouldn't you? You know you could take any one of a number of them. Take a lot of that one, that one, that one, that one, and that one. So how do you take make a good horse into a great horse? Do you, do you, there, there's always that level of, uh, of, of of the trainers always wanting to to make these things better. Um, can can you do it in, in, in terms of trimming or shoeing, or, or or do you believe that that what you're given is, is is what you got, and and your job is to is to keep them sound and, and keep them going, or or, or or are there things that you can do mechanically to 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 improve a horse? Um, the answer is yes in both cases. Um, first and foremost, you can only you can only deal with what you've got, so so the ability obviously has got to be there. You cannot make a great horse from just horseshoeing. But you can influence performance and reduce the likelihood of pathology with careful um, application of shoes. Um, when we look at the marking system now, you know, of dressage as a classic example, um, and and how fine it is, how close it is between you know the top sort of six or seven. You know, a, a half a percent, it could be the difference in winning a medal and not winning a medal, or winning a gold and winning a, winning a silver. So that, and this is where we, this is where, where, where Farry becomes really challenging. Because we will look at the data, we will look at the videos, we will look at the data, we will, we will research it, and we will see whether there's any, and cross-reference that with any pathology of a certain movement. So if a horse is repeatedly moved, marked down, for one particular movement, there has to be a reason for it. And in a majority of cases, we normally, from a, from a fairy point of view, we normally pick it up quite early. Because what we will see is we will see lever arms. I'll see lever arms doing different things. And then I'll say, well, yeah, that's OK. But actually, the minute you're going to try this movement, you're going to have difficulty. And, and, and that has happened so often where, where we've said to riders, OK, take the pirouette, for, for example. The collection for the pirouette, and they'll shorten the stride, shorten the stride, shorten the stride. Then all of a sudden, you have you have a, a hind limb that has a fractional deviation laterally on one side more than the other, which means that when that hind limb then picks up and then rotates, it comes underneath the centre of mass too far, and the horse then from a from an aesthetic point of view falls off, falls off. Pirouette to the left is quite stable. Pirouette to the right is slightly unstable. Pirouette to the left gets sevens, eights. Pirouette to the right gets fives. 
So we can look at that and we can know, but we normally pick that up quite early. And there are, there are changes that you can make in the shoeing that does not have any um, impact on anything else that merely acts as a, as a stabilizer. So it's for when that movement comes in that the horse, is, the limb then is more upright it is then more supportive, but more importantly, when it loads, if you put a slight stabilizer, a slight lateral extension on there or whatever, wherever it needs to be, to be, as long as it's in the right place, that then acts as a stabilizer. You then, and you get these riders that say, actually, this is incredible. I'm always struggling to the right. This, this, this just feels so much better. So, so we know from, from practice that we can make a difference. We know from doing it for a long period of time that we don't get any any adverse effect as a result of it. Because when I started to do this in the early days, the veterinary industry or profession in particular were saying, they were very critical of it by saying, well, yes, but you don't know what else you're affecting. You don't know what else you're affecting. And you say, well, actually, I'm not affecting anything because I'm, a, I'm the way I place it and where I place it, I'm allowing the deviation of the limb to occur because that is natural. I'm allowing the limb to actually go in the direction that it wants to, I'm not affecting that. What I am affecting is the first point of contact, because what I want to do is I want to bring this limb out slightly rather than come underneath the central mass. Um, that then means that it's more upright, and there's a tranche of things that happen. There's a trade-off as that, you know, the hock displacement that we see, the lever arm displacement laterally reduces, so you reduce the likelihood of pathology, you know, in the hock, etc., etc., etc. So that's just one classic example, but that that that's that's what we do to put everything under the microscope you know with those top horses can we get an extra half a percent year on half a percent there um and 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 you're duty bound to 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 at least have a look at it on, on the horse where you're going to put the lateral extension i think you first should get out the fuller and, and just wide that branch and, and if that did that it deemed is not quite enough, then, then, then you'll start adding something. Absolutely, and I think, I think, I think we've been doing it for such a long time, you, 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 you instinctively look at it and you know what you're going to do, you know where it is, you know um, what it is that you're going to do. But they, you, can, you can have a situation where, where forging, forging the heel, so again, you know the difference between a, 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 a concave shoe and a, and a flat shoe. Uh, a concave shoe, you are very limited in what you can do with that material because there's very little material there. If you've got a three-quarter fullered shoe and you've got a nice, nice solid heel, you can forge it, you can fuller it, um, you can then put extensions on there if you want to, you know, if, if it's deemed appropriate. Um, uh, but, I, but I think an awful lot of these things, you have to be careful that, that just every horse that you see might not need a lateral extension. Yes. It, it, it again, we come back to the ticking boxes, you know. And again, you may need it just on, on the one foot and not, not the other. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we we treat e treat each limb individually. Um, now, if you look at at um, the other golden girl, if you if you if if you look at uh, Minstrel Horace uh, as an example, he has a lateral extension on the left hind um, to give him a, a stabilizer. But he actually, he has a medial and lateral extension on the right hand, purely because of the way that he is conformed and the way that, that he's set up. Um, that's We've shot him like that all the time I've been shooting him. I've always shot him like that. Um, because it's the only thing that, 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 you know, to create that platform for him individually, mm -hmm. that's what you have to do. So, you know, two completely different shoes. And, and going back to, to, to the point of mismatched feet, you know, why, why do we shoe mismatched feet with the same shoes? I've never worked that one out. Um, I tend not to shoe to radiographs. Um, I have an aversion to shoe into radiographs unless there is a pathology. Um, a radiograph is a static sound bite, a moment in time of a limb that is loaded statically. And um, some horses, for example, might have an A-frame in front. So to have an A-frame and stood like this, they're going to be lower medially than, than they are laterally. If you X-ray them, they will, they will, certainly, they're, they're, they will certainly be lower and, and P3 will appear to be leaning medially. Um, some of those horses, not all, but some of those horses, if you try and straighten them up by actually trimming, if you can trim the lateral aspect, or even 
or even elevating the media aspect, you they won't like it. They won't like it at all. Um, I, I'm very much for dynamic shoeing. So I'll use a, an X-ray um, if we have pathology, or if I think that there's something, some a reason why this horse's gait has changed. But I tend to to look more intrinsically at the gait, at the at the at the limb loading, not necessarily the footfall, but the limb loading. Um, I'm not a great fan of shoeing to a static X-ray. So, so do you try to get the, the dynamic so it's like, like, with the flat footfall, or, or do you make modifications to your shoes to to, to lessen the the impact of the horse is 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 less than perfect confirmation? I think I think we as an industry we're too hung up on footfall. I think we 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 are looking at trying to get horses to land level, and sometimes you don't they don't want to land level. Uh, and there's not a reason why they should land level. Um, I think it's the limb loading phase is the one that I look at. Um, and yes, I will make modifications to shoes. I will sometimes occasionally put a, a, a medial lift on or a lateral lift or a spiral shoe on the basis that what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to create a platform that allows the limb to, 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 to come down on and, to, and the fetlock to hyperextend so that it has even pressure and even stability through what you've created as a baseline. Um, but that horse might land unevenly. It's first point of contact, right. but it's how the limb loads um, is the key. It's the key to soundness, without a shadow of doubt, because the other, the other one will, will, repeat, uh, will get repetitive strain injury, injury very quickly. So often, or it used to be, that, that it was very easy to identify a farrier's work by, by, by the, how they were set up, that everybody had a particular style. What, what, what would you, you, you probably uh, describe your style as being, if, if there is one? Uh, well, there is one, yeah, there's definitely one. Um, there's definitely one. It's quite interesting that, that, that when some of these horses, and they don't necessarily know who they are, if they go off and, and they go to competitions, the, the amount of people that have come back and said, uh, and farriers, you know, the, 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 you know, the show farrier, I looked at something and said, "Well, can I have a look at this?" And then they picked up. They said, "Oh, you know, Hayden Price shot this," and uh, and I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. I don't. I don't. Yeah, I've I've always had a, a style. I've always always had a style, and um, and I'm quite pernickety because the young the youngest apprentice I've got at the moment still hasn't quite got the heel uh, to my. And I keep telling him it's a trademark. It 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 it's it, there is. He hasn't quite got it uh, when, when we're finishing off and grinding up shoes and linishing them up and everything. Both with the front and the hind uh, shoes? Both of them. And he hasn't quite got it yet. And he keeps trying and he gets frustrated and I say, no, it's like this. And you just do it. I say, that's how I want it. And, and you know, who knows? Perhaps it doesn't make any difference, but, but that's how I want it. That's, that's what I like. <laughs> that's hard to teach. Sometimes. I like. It is actually. It is very hard to teach. And I can understand his frustration because he thinks he's doing it. Yeah. And I, and, I, and I just keep saying, look, you know, we're not seeing the same thing, you know, yeah. but, but one day it'll click. Yeah, well, it'll, it'll, day it'll, it'll, it'll click. The, you know, we can talk on specifics there because I mentioned that, you know, we had the, the, the Olympics in London, as you, as you well know. And because of British dressage and the fact that they, that they had escalated to this sort of number one slot, there was pressure on everybody. Um, and these horses, we all know these horses, like human athletes, are prone to injury on a regular basis, you know. The pressure that, that's placed on you is quite immense. I, I, I've been doing this for 30 years and I'd never ever experienced pressure that I placed on myself. Nobody else placed it on I placed it on myself. Um, and it was only afterwards, it was only after the Olympics that I realized you know just how much pressure there was um, because like all teams we had issues uh, we had issues that had to be dealt with um, that um, means that that there is a potential selection issue that means that there is a potential medal winning issue um, and those decision the decision making process for that runs very very deep and very very high 
And I think as practitioners and, and as service providers, even at that level, it's up to us to execute that in the same way that the riders would. The only difference between a rider and a coach and an owner and, and a support person like myself is that, that a rider might have one chance in their lifetime of going to an Olympics. Might be that one horse that's come along at that one time that they get selected for. So they have their whole career riding on this horse going to that Olympics. Their whole career. I've done three Olympics and I'll be doing a fourth. So I'll have another day. And whilst I might, I might not have, um, or it might not have worked, um, is this something that I haven't done that's created that? So I think, I think you tend, what you tend to do, and when the pressure's really on, there's no harm in having a little bit of self-doubt. Um, because I think if you, if, you're, if you don't have self-doubt, and if you don't question what you're doing, um, absolutely to the nth degree, then you're in danger of being just a little bit blasé about it. Um, but, it, but it took me, I'm not, I'm not ashamed to admit that, that the Olympics took me to a place I'd never been to before. It, with pressure. And uh, I'm not so sure I'd want to visit it again for a while, to be honest with you. But I think the pressure's off now a, a, a little bit. I think, you know, when we look at, at Team GBR, and we, um, we, we are, we, we've still got the number one. Um, that's fine, we, 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 you know, we're still up there. But I think there's an air of acceptability. I think we had to prove something. We, we, we'd come from, from winning you know, silver in here in Kentucky, um, uh, which was surprised. We, we surprised the, the, the global scene, really. Um, but then, then Carl and, and, and so forth, and, and Laura and Charlotte and everybody else that comes through worked on that, you know, and they built on it rather than sit back on their laurels. Um, it, it can be a very lonely place. It can, it can be a very, very lonely place. And, it, and people think that, that, um, it, it, that you get remembered for, you know, the event that comes in with three shoes and is not going to get through the trot up and somehow you do something that's going to get it through the trot up and people will remember you for that. It's the work that goes on on a daily basis that, that hopefully you'll get, you'll get recognition for because that's the bit that keeps these horses sound. You know, an accident can happen anywhere. You know, a horse can lose a shoe, it can overreach, it can do all sorts of things. But I think, you know, for me it's about, it's about continually... And that was, that was the... The, I said to somebody um, yesterday, uh, and I'm totally open book on it, it was only after the Olympics that I drove home from Greenwich and I, and I was physically exhausted, I was mentally exhausted, and I was happy and I was elated and all of those sort of mixed emotions. And when I was driving home, I can honestly say for the first time in my whole career, I felt comfortable in my own skin. I actually felt as though as though I didn't really have to question myself anymore because we'd looked I'd looked after the whole of the team not just for the competition but actually for years before so, so uh, I, I really felt uh, I really felt good I found, but it wasn't necessarily for the gold medal it was I just felt well we must have done something right you know over a continued period of time <laughs>